Um, so uh, just to give a little background, so you actually know I, I have some credentials here to speak about this today. Um, I, uh, I'm an attorney, uh, went to uh, Robert H. McKinney School of Law, graduated summa cum laude. Uh, my current uh, employment is with uh, uh, personal injury and wrongful death is our focus. Um, I am our research and writing guy, so uh, research is huge for me um, and lends itself kind of uh, hand in hand with what we're talking about here today. Um, I do all of our appellate work and things like that. So um, getting into old documents is uh, it, a lot of what I do. Um, it may surprise some people uh, talk about kind of getting outside my usual area, uh, but uh, personal injury, wrongful death, that sort of stuff actually has a lot of involvement with probate courts. Uh, granted, you know, modern, uh, uh, modern stuff, but um, it, uh, it does lend itself a little bit. And I can talk some about uh, how that works today. Um, but let's go ahead and get right into it. So <clears throat> Aristotle says law is order, good law is good order. Um, there are people involved with the law though. And uh, as you can probably imagine, we try and do uh, orderly disposition on uh, probate, on wills, uh, on everything in that manner. Uh, but it gets sticky even with clear law because people like to fight. Um, the uh, thing about clear law is it's rare. There's a lot of wiggle room and especially when it comes to probate. Um, so uh, when you're going into stuff, you're going to see disputes quite frequently, um, but uh, hopefully disputes that get resolved that uh, we actually have a clear answer on. So now, there's some important terms here. We, we're going to toss around probate. So the uh, probate is a, a root in Latin. Uh, most literally, it, it's a proving. <clears throat> so it's typically associated with proving the contents of a will, proving the validity of a will. You're taking it there to the judge and saying, hey, this is what the guy wanted done. This is what the lady wanted done. We need to distribute assets and everything accordingly on their death. Now, probate courts, though, don't just handle uh, deceased person's assets, okay? So they uh, can also handle uh, guardianships, um, particularly uh, guardianships over um, uh, people, uh, incompetence, which everything from minors uh, to people who uh, mental incapacity, physical incapacity, who can't handle their things. Um, and uh, they even uh, extend beyond people uh, just to directly uh, issue orders about things. And I'll go into that a little bit more about uh, what we call in rem proceedings and probate uh, a little bit later. But um, the will, everybody kind of knows what that is. Um, wills have very specific requirements in each state to be valid. Uh, I am going to talk about Indiana quite a bit because that's my, uh, uh, my jurisdiction. Um, and uh, what uh, Indiana does for wills, you have to, has to be in writing. Um, there's only a handful of states now, maybe even one, uh, that still allow an oral will, um, but it's just so hard to prove. It's very, very, uh, usually, uh, almost everybody's gone away from that. Uh, but will has to be in writing, uh, has to be done uh, of sound mind, free will. You have to uh, get two witnesses don't have to be witnesses who read it, but they have to be witnesses uh, who are standing there while you say, hey, this is my will. Um, I want you to sign it to verify that I have told you this is my will. This is what I want done. I'm signing this um, under my free will, something like that. Um, but uh, without hitting all the marks for each, whatever state you're in, you don't have a valid will. So let's say you have a valid will, you die, you died testate. So the way to think about that is you have testified about what you want done with your stuff. Okay, you, you've made a statement uh, and it's a statement in writing your will. Now, here's a couple of things. What if your will is invalid? Or what if you never made a will? Well, then you died intestate. You did not, or you, you do not have a valid direction of where your assets are supposed to go when you die. And when you die intestate, it's not just up in the air, anybody can grab your property. The law has very, very specific 
in most jurisdictions, I should say, in Indiana in particular, we have very specific uh, order of operation for who collects the estate, um, which is nice because you can just kind of go down a list and say, does this apply? No, does this apply? No. And eventually you hit your category of, hey, okay, I fit here. I have, you know, this person had uh, no spouse, uh, two kids. So uh, that hits this category. And then the state distributes it according to that law. All right. Now, I do want to emphasize that any court overseeing probate varies state to state. The laws change within a state uh, quite frequently. Uh, the type of courts change with that handle probate. Um, so it's really important here, just like everything with genealogy, that you're aware of the history. So the current probate court in a given county um, may not have existed even, a, a, you know, 100 years ago or so. So uh, you need to be aware of that when you're doing your research. Um, part of the, the anecdote there, too, is county uh, lines change a lot of times. So you think you're looking in one county. Uh, but uh, it actually is a different one at this point because the county lines have changed. Okay, I'm gonna give some examples. This is all from Indiana. Um, our courts have been uh, rearranged many, many times over the years. Um, so we had a, a period uh, pre-statehood where we had a specific probate court. Uh, there was also a special orphans court uh, we then changed it to a court of common pleas uh, that was used for, for a little while. Uh, some states still use that term. Um, then uh, we ended up having a circuit court, which you know, literally refers to a judge who wrote a circuit and you know went county to county. Uh, now uh, each county has its own circuit court, but I digress. Uh, with statehood, we have a constitution, circuit courts established. Another probate court gets established, go back to Court of Common Pleas, and then we kind of said, okay, let's quit changing it. We're just going to have circuit courts. Uh, however, uh, each county, depending on uh, the caseloads, uh, can add additional courts uh, under superior courts. So you have one circuit court judge uh, and then superior courts that handle uh, other matters, uh, very frequently probate matters as well. So uh, for example, uh, you have superior courts in Lake, LaPorte, Porter counties in Indiana. There are others, uh, our own Allen County, the superior court oversees uh, probate. We do have a designated magistrate for our probate court, which a lot of these counties do, even though it's technically generally in a circuit or superior court, there's going to be a magistrate who focuses on that stuff. Um, there are special designated probate courts uh, outside of the circuit and superior courts in some larger counties as well. Uh, it just depends on how they organize them. So you have to be aware of that, uh, even for modern searches, um, that you're looking in the right place. But typically speaking, uh, with newer, uh, newer cases or newer estates, uh, you'll still be able to find those even if you don't know exactly the court structure. Okay, so that's all about Indiana, and let's talk about our laws pertaining to probate. A lot of these are very similar uh, from state to state. You do have uh, strange states um, that, uh, such as uh, Louisiana that uh, I won't go into uh, that just have, uh, well, I won't say insane, but I will say kind of crazy law. Moving on, uh, probate documents. Let's talk about some terms here. So you have a petition. So a petition is what gets filed uh, in Indiana in order to uh, open up an estate. You have to open the estate. Uh, it's either supervised or unsupervised. So a supervised estate, the court actually has uh, higher, uh, stricter standards. You have to give more reporting, uh, telling the court what's going on, what the assets are, everything like that um, very frequently. Whereas if you have an unsupervised estate, um, it's somebody that uh, the court considers probably trustworthy or it's a simple estate. And the judge just essentially at the end of the day is uh, when you close out, you have to give them an accounting and that's about it. And then they can close it out summarily uh, quite frequently. But you file that petition. Petitions can also be for guardianship. Um, petitions uh, can even be uh, 
what I frequently do is if we have a, a minor who's injured and we have a, a settlement proposal, we have to file a petition for approval with the court, um, with the uh, probate court, in order to um, get to get that settlement approved to protect the child just in case, you know, if they weren't represented, somebody could take advantage of them and give them a small settlement or something like that for, for their injuries. Um, <clears throat> now, most of the time uh, in Indiana, you simply take an oath that, hey, you're going to be the administrator or the personal representative of the estate, and that's all you have to do to be appointed. Um, if you meet other qualifications, of course. However, if there's any potential, um, you know, if the court doesn't trust you, they're not going to appoint you. Uh, but let's say uh, you live out of state, you know, your, your parent passed away in one state, you live in another, uh, but you want to be, you're supposed to be the executor of the will. Well, you, uh, the court may require you to post a bond and actually uh, pony up some money uh, to the court that they're going to hang on to just in case you don't actually fulfill your duties. <clears throat> One way to get around that, of course, is to have maybe uh, you know a, a co-executor or something like that who actually lives in state. Uh, the whole issue being you want to make sure that the court has jurisdiction in order to uh, uh, in order to um, <clears throat> the court needs jurisdiction just in case you do something that you're not supposed to. Uh, if you live in another state, um, you know, it's a, a kind of a pain to try and uh, get any control over somebody else, um, but I'm, I'm digressing on all that. So we're talking about letters of administration um, and letters of testamentary. Um, <clears throat> these are kind of the same thing. It's basically something that the court is going to give the administrator, the executor, the personal representative, whatever uh, terms being used, um, they're going to give them so that they can go around with a seal from the court saying, hey, I get to, uh, uh, I get access to this person's property. So normally a bank account has the deceased person's name on it, nobody else. Well, you can't just walk in and say, hey, I, I need that money because I'm doing an estate. You need a uh, letter's from the court that are sealed, signed and sealed from the clerk, stating that you have authority to exercise control over property, accounts, whatever. Uh, it proves that you're allowed to do what you're doing. Now, an inventory, this would be more for a supervised estate. Um, an inventory is what you would submit uh, to the court, basically outlining, well, here's all the property we've got. <clears throat> now, if you don't have much property, typically you don't have to do this. You know, you sign a thing saying in Indiana, well, the estate's under $50,000, so there's no reason to go through all this. Um, but if it's, you know, large estate, then the court may want you to actually give uh, an inventory, which then goes to a final accounting as well. I'll talk about in a second. Um, you do have appraisements and stuff. You can't just uh, sell somebody's house for a dollar. Um, if you are uh, an executor or an administrator, uh, personal representative of the estate, um, you, you actually have a, a, a duty to the estate itself to make sure that you're uh, um, basically getting top dollar for anything that's being sold uh, and managing all the funds and property uh, in a proper manner. <clears throat> Orders, um, the order from the court can be any number of things. Um, so that's uh, uh, not something particularly difficult. You just have to, each time you see an order, you just read it and figure out, okay, well, what is this about? Um, orders uh, aren't frequently issued sui sponte. Like the judge typically doesn't just issue an order without uh, it being in response to a petition, a motion, um, something else where somebody files. Uh, something with the when in the probate case. So uh, one thing, if you see an order, that's usually a good indication that you're also looking for another document that was filed that the order is responding to. All right. Um, <clears throat> we also have uh, a sale bill. Um, you know, a lot of stuff. I'll, I'll just kind of say you need proof of what's done um, uh, with uh, with any assets. Um, final distributions, this is what we also call a final accounting, 
showing here's the assets, here's what we did with them, here's all the people who made claims, whether we paid them or not. Um, the judge has to eventually um, approve the entire accounting to close out the estate. So if you did something you're not supposed to, the hammer, uh, or in this case, gavel, can be brought down on you pretty hard. And then um, probate packet, uh, uh, not quite a technical term, but um, uh, that's something where if you're just looking for the whole thing, um, that's kind of what you're going for. Now let's talk about some examples here. All right, this is what a petition might look like. As a matter of fact, uh, this is similar to what I still file. Uh, caption is about the same. So that top portion there gives you information. Okay, this is in a, a trial court because it's a county court rather than an, a, a court of appeals or a Supreme Court. Um, <clears throat> it's in Hall County, Nebraska. We know that. This is about the estate of this uh, Mr. Clarkson, deceased. And you read to the right there, petition for letters testamentary. Okay. That uh, is a very similar caption to what you would see today in most states. It tells you the court, tells you the county, tells you why it's being filed and what's being filed. Um, so this uh, is a pretty, pretty flowery way of saying that, well, this guy's passed away. He did have a will and we need the court to review it, uh, get us appointed so that we can execute the will is essentially uh, what this is all about. So uh, pretty standard language in there. And you know, uh, we, we do the same thing today. OK, so this is where if you do have to post a bond, um, that uh, this is something that uh, uh, it's an official document and you are uh, usually tendering some amount of money in order uh, to have the court uh, basically trust that you're actually going to do what you're supposed to do. And they typically, like I said, they do this when they wouldn't normally have jurisdiction over someone. So if they're out of state is quite frequently why that would happen. May also happen uh, depending on the size of the estate. Um, and in that case could potentially be a larger bond as well. It just depends. Um, but uh, bonds are not really common anymore. <clears throat> is a letter of administration. Um, now, of course, um, this is not, it is a little difficult to read on me, but I'm sure for you genealogists, you are used to uh, reading this sort of script. Um, I'm unfortunately gotten too used to uh, typed print that I have a hard time reading some of this. Um, but uh, so this would be a letter of administration. Nowadays, it has to be officially sealed as well as signed. Um, but uh, it uh, essentially will still be, hey, you know, the, I have authority to do this. It will usually as well have a reference to a specific case and um, modern times a, a cause number, a case number. And uh, it, so it's possible for the person who gets this to say, ah, I'm not so sure about this, but then I go look at the court document. And, oh yeah, they are. Okay. Here's an inventory. Inventories are great for genealogists. It gets to tell you all sorts of stuff about the property, not just here's the value of the estate, but here's the, uh, the assets in the bank that this person had. Um, it can also be talking about particular property, probably include lot numbers, flats, um, locations of property, things like that. Um, so you, you really, if you find one of these, it's great. Now, let's talk about that. So an inventory can literally be, depending on the record, it can go down to the room of the house telling you, hey, this contained this, 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 and this. All right. Um, it uh, gives good descriptions if there's, uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, valuable asset, usually, and uh, as it can tell you the occupation, um, the general uh, uh, assets they had available as far as were they wealthy, were they poor, um, you know, all, all sorts of things there. And it's just kind of a deep dive you can do to figure out uh, and get a real look into your ancestor's life, really. Um, if you go through an inventory and it um, only has 
uh, you know, two rooms, well, you, you know, they didn't have a large home, you know, kind of thing like that. So, tells you socioeconomic status. If there's any family heirlooms, those will usually be noted along with rather than dollar figure where they're going to go. There could be dollar figures assigned, especially if this is something where um, assets are being divvied up by different kids. Uh, you could have an heirloom that's worth uh, a heck of a lot of money. And if one person gets it, uh, that will be uh, that will offset the other share they may get from the estate. So it's important for those um, that uh, that you actually take that into account when an heirloom comes in. Uh, if your uh, uh, sibling gets, um, you know, some giant diamond worth $100,000 and then also gets the same distribution of money from the estate, you're probably not going to be super happy about that. Um, <clears throat> gives you names. So in the estate, it's not just who gets to, um, who's an heir or, or who is a beneficiary. And I'll mention a beneficiary is usually what uh, we refer to somebody who is uh, getting something out of a will. And an heir is somebody who is receiving based on an intestate distribution. So those may be terms you see. They can be used interchangeably and depending on jurisdiction, they could be used uh, differently or entirely different <clears throat> people, uh, different names being used. You can also find uh, enslaved people, indentured servants, uh, because quite frankly, they're considered assets in the estate, all right? Um, the uh, uh, important thing also, I, I wanna mention the creditors. Creditors can file a claim in the estate. So if you owed somebody money when you died, um, they just don't, you know, they don't wanna write that off. So you open an estate, and then you have somebody who comes into court and says, hey, you owe me. Uh, a uh, administrator can do two things. Um, they can uh, allow or disallow the claim. If they say, oh yeah, it's a valid claim, the creditor gets paid out of the estate, um, or they can disallow it, say, no, I don't think it's valid, and then it's up to the creditor to then go to the court and uh, actually uh, file a motion and say that, well, no, we're owed this money and prove it and then make the estate, uh, the administrator pay out from the estate. Um, very frequently, uh, these uh, these are just a matter of course, you know, it's a credit card bill or something like that, where it's not really something to dispute. Um, I do note uh, with, uh, with some creditors, um, you may have uh, situations where you look at it. I had a, a client one time where I had a creditor come in um, and they uh, they couldn't give me any documentation. They said, oh no, this person owes us and they had a bill. But I was like, well, can you tell me, you know, what was provided? Like this bill doesn't tell me anything and they couldn't. So um, I, uh, as the attorney for the personal representative, I said, well, no, we're not gonna pay you. They went away. So that's uh, one thing you can do. Um, but uh, yeah, the... Uh, uh, there are usually limitations as well. So if you open an estate, most states will have a limit on how long a creditor has in order to file a claim. So you don't have to just keep the estate open in perpetuity to see if somebody files a claim. They have a very limited time period. Um, in Indiana, it's uh, once the estate's open, they only have three months to file a claim. And if an estate never gets opened, well, um, in that situation, the uh, creditor can't seek any reimbursement after nine months of the date of death. All right, this is also something we can look at appraisals for dollar figures for items in the estate. All right. Now, so we have uh, orders as far as sales go. Um, and uh, if you need uh, approval from the court to do any sort of uh, 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 distribution or, or, like I say, sale of any of the property, unfortunately, you will also see these um, when it comes to enslaved people, uh, enslaved persons. Uh, there may be orders on this just the same as uh, there would for a regular piece of property or something, because that's how the law was treating them. Um, so uh, it is... Uh, 
while a good resource to find, still something that uh, kind of uh, a little bit of a, a little bit of a shame towards the country still. Um, but um, that's uh, that's just what we have to live with with the law as it was. Okay. So we have a sale bill. There's a certification here, um, and uh, that's a. Uh, just a simple thing that may or may not be filed with the court. Some documents you just maintain, and then if the judge wants to see him, you give them to him. Um, this is more for like a supervised estate where you would have to provide proof of what was done with the assets. You have a final settlement, a final distribution. Uh, we call that also a final accounting. Um, sometimes it can be super detailed, sometimes it won't be. Um, very frequently, <laughs> it depends on the judge, whether the judge wants uh, something super detailed or not. Um, I happen to know county by county which judges want uh, uh, a book and which judges are fine with just saying, hey, we uh, got everything paid, we got everything dispersed, there's nothing left over, close out uh, the estate. Um, there, there's a few of those out there and they make my life easier, but uh, at the same time, eh, they might wanna be doing a little bit more there, but I'm not gonna complain at the moment. How are you finding probate records? Uh, so I don't search old probate records, but I'm informed uh, by uh, the uh, uh, folks at the Island County Public Library that uh, quite a few, if not most of them actually are online. So you can check family search, ancestry. Uh, you can check um, any of the abstracts or transcriptions uh, that people have done, especially through the Genealogy Center and Percy, uh, which you heard uh, Allison Singleton talk about at the beginning of this program. Great resources, but what happens when you can't find it? All right. Most of these records are preserved at county courthouses. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of county courthouses don't have a great way of preserving records. So you'll find that, uh, especially if there's a you know, tragic event, fire, flood, things like that, a lot of old records, uh, the, uh, the folks who are just thinking in a practical manner think, uh, well, we don't need these anymore and get rid of them. That can be a problem. Um, luckily, uh, especially uh, there's been a push uh, again in Indiana where um, old records we're trying to preserve and they get uh, sent to state archive a lot of time. Um, so those are places to check as well. Um, but the, uh, the county courthouses, they're a good place to start. Keeping in mind, as I mentioned, that the county you think you're looking in may not be the county you actually should be looking in. Big example I give is uh, Knox County in Indiana used to take up almost the entire state whereas now it's a smaller county, um, average size county, I should say. Um, so you might see something in Knox County um, and go searching in modern Knox County, but it actually was something from the Southern part of the state. So, okay. Talk real, uh, uh, we'll talk about this, uh, the enslaved ancestors situation again. And, um, this is, like as I mentioned, this is a tough research and it's difficult as any of you who have uh, attempted to do this research know. Um, but uh, enslaved persons still went through um, the probate courts. Uh, the will uh, controlled uh, the in enslaved persons just the same as it did other pieces of property, unfortunately. Um, if uh, there really was a dispute, so there used to be courts of equity um, uh, versus courts of law. And uh, if there was a dispute over heirs or beneficiaries about well, what the will actually said or who's supposed to receive what, uh, particularly, you know, when you're talking about an estate, a lot of times um, assets are divided up by children. And um, in the most, you know, crude, in the most crude sense, obviously you can't divide up a person. So there may be a dispute over who gets the, the person versus who gets the value uh, of what an enslaved person might be. Um, so you, you could see disputes along that line as well. Uh, going again to the intestate, sometimes it just makes things more simple. 
so that the statutory law determines who the heirs are, but it doesn't necessarily, again, determine things uh, that are not divisible, uh, such as a person. In Mississippi, for example, uh, widows are entitled to a one-third share of their husband's estate, and then it was divided equally amongst children. Um, Indiana, a widow receives 50% of an intestate estate, and the rest is divided amongst the children, except there's all sorts of exceptions. Uh, if the uh, widow is a second wife and there are children from a previous marriage, um, the uh, uh, distribution changes, percentages change, uh, but then there's a caveat also about real property that the widow, the second wife's entitled to, um, and then it gets more complex uh, if you don't have kids uh, or a spouse, and then it starts talking about brothers and sisters and parents, and, and then uh, you have uh, you know, next of kin, which, you know, there's a whole rabbit hole to go down there. But most states, as, as I say, Indiana does, has a real good job of, uh, of setting out, okay, if you have this person, this is how it's distributed. If you don't have a spouse, this is how it's distributed. So those are helpful. What you do need to make sure, though, is you're looking at the right, um, the right law. So as I mentioned, laws change, intestate succession changes just the same as everything else. And so if the time period you're looking at, you don't want to be looking at a uh, modern law book for that. You instead want to be looking at something uh, contemporary for the uh, individual that you're looking for uh, or how things are being distributed. One of the best resources is to uh, go to uh, your courts who may have uh, old law books. Um, I do know uh, most Supreme Courts uh, for each state uh, or however they uh, term their highest court, different states have different terms. Um, they will maintain records of all uh, different statutory laws uh, and most of the time dating even before statehood. So some of those might be difficult to get in to see, they may be protected. Um, but it's still usually accessible if you jump through the right hoops. Now, still talking about using census and probate records. Here's some examples. So um, we've located a person that uh, may be uh, a owner of an enslaved person under the law. Okay. Now, we're going to find the probate records for that person. So this is like a probate packet. Okay. So we see, okay, Elisha King being of sound mind. Okay. This is the uh, intro that sound mind almost always indicates uh, that what's following is a will. Okay. You're publishing the will. What the publishing means is you're not putting it in a book, um, but you're putting it out there for people to see. So something is published when other people can see it essentially in, in the law. Uh, so this is a last will and testament uh, provoking any will that he previously made. So when you make a will, you have to put a line in that you're revoking other wills normally depending on the state, uh, just so that way Somebody can't try and dispute like, well, here's this one and it's just as valid as this other one. Um, caveat to that is you can actually um, make amendments to a will without revoking it. Those are uh, called uh, codicils. I think I'm supposed to talk about that later, but hey, I mentioned it now. Here's part of the will. So we're looking through and we're finding some names here. So Gabriel, Barney, Harriet. Rinda. All right, so now let's look at the census. All right, here's those people. We see their names. Um, we look at the 1870 census. Okay, we can get an idea who they are. Well, we back up and now we have uh, 1960 slave schedule. We get some more information there. And then uh, in 1852, pardon me, we have uh, people that are named in that will we just looked at. So there's those names, and here we are in 1852 will for that individual, there they are.
Okay. Probate terms. There's a lot of them. And a lot of these uh, change jurisdiction uh, by state to state. Um, but general categories, the people who are the ones uh, actually uh, in charge of the estate, I, I've used these terms already, but you may have administrators, uh, a personal representative of an estate, you may have an executor of a will. Um, uh, very often uh, the term executor usually is used in a will itself, but a lot of times it'll just then they'll get uh, letters of administration on that. Um, so they're administering the will uh, or the estate. Uh, personal representative is usually when you aren't probating a will, but you need an estate open for someone. Uh, one example of that is uh, I always need a personal representative appointed uh, when unfortunately uh, uh, there has been a death and I represent a, a surviving family member. Um, I have to get a uh, estate open and appoint the surviving family member as a personal representative so that then they can make a claim against the person who caused the death. So an affidavit is a statement made under personal knowledge uh, where you are a competent individual, usually over the age of 18, um, who uh, is testifying under penalties of perjury and that you have personal knowledge about the thing that you are stating in the affidavit. So that can pretty much be anything. Uh, you have an affidavit of you know, what you had for breakfast. You, you could do that. You sign it under penalties of perjury. You're saying this is true and I'm sticking to it. Um, but with affidavits as well, that'll be um, affidavits uh, relating to the administration of a will quite frequently. Um, if you are uh, closing out, trying to get a summary uh, closing of a will, you will uh, have to sign something under penalties of perjury, sometimes called an affidavit um, to go along with it. So, but quite simply put, if you see an affidavit, that's whoever's signing it is saying this is true and I'm taking an oath on perjury that it is true. So if it's not, the court then gets to turn around and sanction them for perjury. A beneficiary is the term that we associate with somebody who collects from a will, who's a designated person in the will. So the beneficiary, quite frequently, you're talking about um, the equivalent of an heir, but it's somebody either specifically named or in a specific class of people. So I can say my son Edward uh, will receive this, that, and the other. He's a beneficiary. I can also say my children will receive this, that, and the other. All of my children, even though not named, and uh, I only have the one, so that would be a surprise to me, um, all of them would be considered beneficiaries under the will. A bequest, um, uh, that is simply a, uh, I'm giving somebody something. It's usually something specific though. It's not just, hey, they get a portion of my estate. Um, you know, I hereby bequeath, something, um, my china, uh, my little dog, you know, something like that. You're, you're designating a particular piece of property usually that somebody is going to receive out of your estate and hopefully they want it. Now a codicil is an amendment to a will. And when I say an amendment, it usually isn't a huge change of terms, but it's adding something on. So let's say I fill out a will and then 30 years from now, I have uh, you know, uh, some other major asset, but I want it distributed uh, very specifically. So I can add on a codicil saying, oh, hey, um, this particular property, I want to go to X. Um, I, you know, in the last, since my last will, I acquired a, a $20,000 piano. Um, I specifically want it to go to this other person. So you'd have a codicil for that. Um, it's not something that should drastically change the terms of the will. It's just kind of a little add-on. All right. So a conservator uh, is somebody who is uh, supposed to manage affairs for an incompetent person. So under the law, incompetent does not mean um, 
incompetent does not mean that uh, you are, are mentally deficient, although it can. Uh, a person under the age of 18 is an incompetent. They are not competent to uh, handle their own affairs because they're not an adult. They haven't reached the age of majority, uh, but it can also be people who uh, either through um, uh, mental issues or dementia or simply just they, they have an infirmity, a physical infirmity where they really can't take care of themselves. It could be conservator uh, for that purpose. Um, it uh, is kind of, a, it's a little different from a power of attorney because a power of attorney, the person doesn't uh, lose the ability to manage their own uh, affairs, whereas typically a conservatorship would. Uh, we don't use the term conservator in Indiana anymore. Um, I'm not sure if uh, we ever did or if it's another jurisdiction, quite frankly. Now we just call them a guardian. And I think that's a better term for it because your goal is to guard the person or assets that you're appointed. Now, a contest. We're, we're, not, uh, we're not flexing. We're, we're not uh, trying to uh, play sports in this contest. It is if there is a will and somebody thinks that they've been disinherited incorrectly or somebody thinks that they're supposed to get more money out of the will than what the administrator uh, is attempting to give them. Um, if they think that a piece of property is worth more than what the administrator is claiming that it's worth. Um, or if they just like to fight with their family, um, they will contest the will. So it's literally saying, I don't think the will is valid, maybe. Um, I, I think that uh, my sibling, when my dad gave him $50,000, that that was supposed to be an advancement on his inheritance and not actually um, just a gift. So that should be, you know, there would be an argument that, well, that 50000 should be taken out of whatever share my brother gets because he already got it from my dad. That's the argument. Uh, fiduciary, still a very common term. Um, sometimes it's you're, you're holding somebody else's assets. Uh, however, it's usually used when you're talking about a duty that you have to somebody else. So if you're a fiduciary, you have a fiduciary duty. What does that mean? Your job is to do everything you can that's in the best interest of the person or asset that you have uh, authority over. So administrators, personal representatives, executors, um, any, any guardian, they have a fiduciary duty to protect the person or asset that they have been appointed to handle. And they if you are a fiduciary, you can be responsible. If you don't, the court can hold you liable for that. All right. So a holographic will is different from an oral will, um, which you know it's been a hot minute since I was in law school, but uh, I believe is an uncupata of will. Um, but a holographic will is something that is just in uh, a person's handwriting. And um, it is not necessarily witnessed. Um, in some jurisdictions, it could be, but it's something that, well, you know, it's in your own hand, so, and nobody's added to it, so the court may approve it. I will tell you, again, most jurisdictions like oral wills uh, aren't favorable for these anymore because um, it's very difficult. Uh, there's always disputes over handwriting analysis and things like that. So at this point, it's just like, well, um, we, we're still gonna hold all the same requirements. Now you could have a handwritten will, but it still has to meet all the same requirements that a regular will would. When in doubt for modern times, just type the thing up. <laughs> um, issue, issue is not a problem. Uh, although depending on the parent, they might disagree with me. Um, issue in probate means offspring. So issue is almost always historically referring to 
um, the actual biological child. Um, it is uh, in uh, uh, maybe uh, it, it's the issue of the loins. <laughs> it is what it actually kind of refers to. Um, however, uh, issue now will also encompass adopted kids um, uh, or half children uh, or uh, half siblings, things like that. They're all still considered the, the legitimate uh, issue or children of the deceased individual. Um, you may see terms like die without issue, leaving no issue. That just means they don't have kids. So we're looking at next of kin or brothers, sisters, parents, something like that. Um, I'm going to very briefly talk about Louisiana because there uh, is a uh, individual at the Allen County Public Library from Louisiana uh, who uh, she is a, a fantastic employee at the Genealogy Center, one of our librarians. And uh, Louisiana is weird. So Louisiana, unlike uh, every other state, isn't really a common law state. It's more what we would kind of call French or Napoleonic law, which means their court system, in my opinion, is really messed up. And um, the worst thing in the world is to try and do research in Louisiana um, for Louisiana law because it's confusing and terrible. Um, they use terms like mystic will. So mystic will is a, a French tradition. Um, you're going to a notary, um, which sometimes notaries used to be equivalent to a lawyer kind of thing, but you know, modern times are not. Um, yeah, lawyers can be notaries, but not all notaries are lawyers kind of thing. Um, the person goes to a notary, writes a will in the presence of a few witnesses and the notary, puts the will in an envelope, seals it. Nobody signs the will, but they do sign that it was put in the envelope. So this is your you know, uh, this is the sealed will that they open up and do a reading of the will kind of thing that really doesn't happen anymore, but um, that's kind of that circumstance. So a mystic will is um, unusual, and my apologies for anyone from Louisiana uh, for uh, disparaging your legal system. Now the last part here, surety. Um, so a surety, often you'll hear a surety bond that's being given. So a surety bond is something um, very similar to the bond. And in fact, you could refer to it as a surety bond that a, a personal representative or administrator would uh, give to the court in order to ensure that they are going to do what they're supposed to. Sureties, however, can also refer to um, uh, insuring agreements, things like that, where you have a surety that I'm saying, I will pay this other person's liabilities. But it's not something where I, I will pay that and that's it. It's I will pay that, but then I get to turn around and go after the person who I paid on their behalf. So it's different than an indem indemnity where, you know, like your insurance company, if you get in a wreck and they, they pay on a claim, they don't turn around and sue you for because they're indemnifying you. That's part of your policy. Um, but there could be a circumstance where they issue a surety, and in that situation, they could turn around and go back at you because they had to pay because of your fault. Going a little off topic with that, but if that comes up, the surety, it is going to be most likely referring to a bond or an agreement to pay on behalf of somebody else for their liabilities, which debts, obligations, things like that. Okay, I'm done rambling. It's time for questions. So I will uh, turn back over to the folks at the Genealogy Center, and we will get started on those questions. Thank you. Uh, if you want to go ahead and turn on your camera, David, and unmute yourself. I'm not sure if everybody would like that, but I will gladly oblige. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so there are some questions. Okay. Um, I'm sure you've already realized that. So let's go through these. Okay. All right, the first one is kind of interesting. What is going to happen with using the court system and probate for genealogy now that so many people have trusts that passed by probate? 
So the trust quite frequently is still going to be something included in a will. Um, a lot of trusts kind of kick into effect at time of death or are considered to take effect the second before you die. Um, so rather than going into an estate, uh, your assets will go into that trust, but your will uh, will still be probated and uh, the, the trust terms and everything are almost always still going to be included in that. Um, and a lot of times that even is going to be uh, specific to um, what uh, personal items or things like that could potentially be going into that. Um, but, you know, you are correct that you're not going to get an inventory necessarily when it comes to trusts. Um, you know, it's it is still something that. Uh, Unfortunately, we have to do in, in order to keep from being uh, taxed and retaxed and retaxed on the same things. Um, but uh, yeah, it does create an extra wrinkle there. I will say trusts are not new. Uh, they're just more common. Thank you. What determines that a will is invalid? Oh, all sorts of stuff. Um, I, I talked about if it's an oral will, not valid. Uh, if it's a, a holographic will, uh, most jurisdictions no longer valid. Um, if uh, you only had one person witness it, not valid. I'm talking Indiana. Uh, if uh, you were uh, if you were drunk, not valid. <laughs> you have to be competent, something like that. Um, so there, there's a litany of things that could render it invalid. What you really want to look at more is what makes it valid. That's a much easier way of looking at things. And if it doesn't meet that criteria, um, which, uh, you know, I've, I haven't written a will for a while, but it, uh, you know, typically is going to be the has to be witnessed. You have to specifically state it's your will. Um, you have to have it signed. Um, it has to be in writing. Those are broadly what most states will require. Yeah. This is an interesting one. Can every will be accessed after a person's death and how? Um, so uh, court records are supposed to be public um, except for limited circumstances. So the default uh, in the US is open courts. We're not trying to hide things. Um, so except in rare circumstances, wills should be accessible when they've been submitted to the court. If they haven't gone through probate, then you're not going to find them. Um, but the default is that you should be able to access them. You shouldn't be denied access except for special circumstances, um, which, you know, that can vary case to case. I can't give any specifics on what might constitute that. Okay. And they're also asking how to access it. Um, you know, with genealogy, it's going to be that family search, ancestry, et cetera, um, but also going to the courthouse. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, I, I will say, so for modern records, Indiana is uh, kind of at the forefront with online access. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, for the last five or six years, um, you can access every court document filed in the last five or six years through uh, just online. You pull it up. Uh, anybody can look it up. Now, not all documents you can actually pull up there, but you can at least see the court docket. Um, some are restricted based on the type of case, especially certain criminal things or involving children or stuff like that. Um, but a lot of the probate stuff, you can just pull up yourself. Um, that is, of course, for modern things. Not all of that is searchable through uh, what the court system provides currently, but it is accessible uh, through uh, the family search and everything that we, we talked about earlier. Thank you. So this one's interesting. I'm going to bring it up because um, you did cover a codicil. Um, somebody's asking if they can add their own handwritten codicil to their present will done by a lawyer many years ago. Okay. Uh, a codicil has the exact same requirements as a will. A codicil is not valid unless you go through the same hoops that you did for the will, because otherwise anybody could just write something out and tack it onto the back and pretend like it, oh yeah, they did that, you know, they, the decedent did it. So no, you need to do the same steps, okay? Now, that's not to say, at least in Indiana, you're not required to have a lawyer draft up your will, all right? Uh, but you are required to follow the specific steps to make it valid. 
So you could write your own will. You just have to make sure that you hit every bullet point of what you're supposed to do in your jurisdiction, in your state. Thank you. Who would typically file the petition? Um, any number of people. Uh, quite frequently, the uh, you know somebody uh, would just file the petition if they have an interest in the estate, um, or uh, oddly enough, uh, sometimes I file a petition um, with uh, just somebody appointed to serve as a personal representative uh, when I need to uh, uh, sue a dead person. Um, I can't sue a dead person. I have to sue their estate. Um, that's going to be in a situation where um, if they caused a severe injury to somebody and, uh, you know, the, in order to get insurance money, we have to technically make a claim against the estate. And so we have to open it up. So uh, anybody could, but most of the time the court's going to say, well, why are you doing this? Any random Joe, uh, the court's not going to approve. It's got to be uh, for a purpose. Most of the time, it's a family member. Now, the interesting thing is you can file a petition and not be the person appointed to be the administrator. All, all the judge has to do once you file it, he can open it, but he can say, I don't trust you. I trust this other person instead. So. Thank you. Can the justice of the peace handle probate and wills? Okay. Um, I don't know. <laughs> as simple as it goes. Uh, it depends on jurisdictions, uh, what authority a justice of the peace has. Um, you know, a lot of times that's just a different term for a judge. Um, and depending on county by county, state by state, they may have authority to do it. Um, you know, a justice of the peace could also have a, a, a limited authority depending on which state you're in or county you're in. So that's going to be a huge variable. Um, but if it's a justice of the peace that's just acting in the same role as a regular judge, just under a different name, then um, yeah, they could. But it's really also going to depend on when I talk about jurisdiction, I just don't, I don't just mean um, within a state, but each court has its own type of jurisdiction. So um, if uh, in a given county, the, um, you know, you file probate stuff in the superior court and it goes directly to the probate magistrate. Uh, if you file it in the circuit court, they're going to tell you to get out and go refile it. So, so speaking of jurisdiction, I'm going to read the next one. Uh, my great grandfather's probate records in Ohio list real estate property in New York in the inventory. Inventory. I didn't find the sale of the property. Shouldn't I see that? What should I look for? Well, hey, thank you for bringing that up because I forgot to talk about in rim actions. Um, so a lot of times when you see an estate, you're going to see uh, in re, um, which is just short for in the matter of, it's in regards to, but in re, that's what we basically mean when we're doing that. Uh, but that'll usually be the estate. Well, there's in rim, R-E-M actions as well. That's an action regarding a piece of property, not a person. So if I die in Indiana and all of my assets are in Indiana, except I own property in Wyoming, well, I, my wife, um, who uh, uh, happens to be on the screen, she would uh, open the estate. Okay. Well, it, she opens the estate, but the judge locally, he's got no authority to do anything with property in Wyoming. So what happens? you have to file a petition for an in rim action regarding that particular property in Wyoming so that a judge there can approve a sale or distribution or transfer the property. So there's your in rim versus in re or in matter of. Thank you. We are running low on time. I'm going to go ahead and um, ask one more question and then we're going to wrap it up. You guys, there's so many other amazing questions in the q and I'm so sorry we can't get to them all. I would highly recommend if you have a question, please email it to us, genealogy at acpl.info, and we will do our best to assist you. Um, and if we have to, we can reach out to David and ask him many of these questions. So uh, please, 
please, please, if we didn't get to your question, please email. Um, but the next one um, I, I think is interesting. If a person passes, but there's no close relatives, how does the court know there is an estate? Ah, uh, good. Okay. Um, so it's entirely possible, especially historically, that something never gets probated. And, uh, you know, if it's, they, the stuff can just disappear. Um, and uh, unless it's uh, like real property and things like that, where there's actually a court record on it. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, if, if there's nobody close, um, and, and I'll, I'll kind of make a caveat with that. So there could still be an heir at law, but let's say there's not. I happen to notice a question on that um, over to the side here. Let's say there's absolutely nobody. You go through the entire intestate statute. You got nothing. This person died and didn't know a soul. Well, in that case, uh, something occurs. It's calling uh, an estate is sheets uh, to the state where nobody else is entitled to it. So it, the state gets it. Awesome. So, Usually that would come up if, if um, you know, you do have real property or something out there, or if you have property just sitting vacant and somebody's like, well, what the heck's going on? Or this car is parked on the street. Nobody knows whose it is kind of thing. And then you figure it out. I do want to say real quick, uh, thank you all for uh, being here today. Uh, if you did attend one of uh, my last presentation earlier this year, uh, I apologize. Uh, I had COVID and 103 degree temperature, uh, but still gave it the old college try. So uh, if I seem disoriented, that is why. So thank you very much. Uh, hopefully I did better today. All right. Thank you, David. Um, it looks like people are very pleased. So thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us for another program. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules. Make sure to sign up for our upcoming programs every Tuesday and Thursday. We give you a free virtual program. So make sure you're registering online and joining us for those. See you next time, guys. Bye. Thank you all.